Okay. Um, there, there's one other tool that's not required for this course, but I think it'll make your lives a lot easier, um, and that's Git and GitHub. Um, how many of you are familiar with, with Git? With uh, version? Oh, good. Yay. GitHub, you guys know what that is? Most everybody? Yay. Okay. That's so nice, because like three years ago, nobody did. I had to explain it. They're like, how does this work? Everything's so cool. You've probably seen that. Um, awesome. So I'm, I'm going to walk through it right now because I want to do it for myself, and so then um, uh, maybe I can you know go a little faster. So okay, uh, but let me tell you tell you why I, I think uh, GitHub uh, getting GitHub is valuable. So first of all, uh, in case there's anyone that that uh, maybe isn't familiar with it, one of the big problems that uh, you, you face in uh, in software engineering is uh, well is working with others. So in this case. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, it's okay sharing your code because at the end of the day, you know you're editing the, the, the you, you won't be able to um, work on your code uh, in, in isolation to get it working so you don't break other people. But then at some point, you want to share that working code with others so that they can integrate into theirs or they can test with it or they can um, you know they they can pick it up where you left off. And uh, for a very long well for. Well, well, since before I entered the profession, um, there have been tools to help manage this. Now, you know, in uh, the, the 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 bad tools were things like shared file systems or sending to somebody in an email or copying into a well-known directory, which people actually did, which is great, which is crazy, right? Because like it's you know, if you, two people change the same file, then this guy would overwrite this other person's changes and they'd be gone. That's awful. So um, they're they're uh, a group, this whole uh, suite of tools um, that did what's called source code management. Um, and, and it gives you, th like, the, the, here again, the ability to work in isolation and then contribute your code back to um, either back to a central location or to share it with other people. And the tools are sophisticated enough to do things like detect when two people have made changes to the same file or even the same location in the file. And if they can figure out, and they, they have the smarts to be able to reconcile those changes. Great, um, and sometimes the changes are in conflict, and the, the tool throws up its arm and says, "Hey, listen, I can't help you with this. You got to do it yourself." Um, and, and so there have been uh, the, the, these tools, and they've um, and they've had different uh, different properties. So, you know, originally uh, they all worked like off of a, a shared file system, and then you had like Subversion, where there was like a central repository, and so you access it over the network. Um, and then you, uh, you know, you committed your code up there. Um, what was sort of the the state of the art right now um, is, or at least the most popular thing right now, and I think it's in many respects the state of the art, um, is is a tool called Git, which is open source. It comes out of the the, the Linux community, um, and uh, it's good for managing your source code. Now, for the most part. Um, I suppose when you're doing pair programming stuff, you'll be you know working with other people. Um, but for your projects anyway, you'll be working on your own. Um, and and so it may, sort of begs the question: Well, why should I put my own stuff in in Git? And actually, maybe I'll, I'll ask you guys. So you've used Git before. Um, why do you use it? Backup, yeah, versioning. Uh, so like you know, when you get something working, you check it in, and then when you break it and you want to start over again, you just revert. So yeah, that's a really good. Anybody? What else do people use it for? Yep. Working on more than one computer, yes. Um, I think that's sort of a, a, another, well, I, you guys might have seen, uh, see, seen me do it. <clears throat> when I want to transfer files between uh, computers, um, Git is really good at that. And it makes sure that it gets everything in there and that it's uh, that not something's missing. Any, anything, anything else? Any other reasons why you guys like to use Git? Mainly those two? Yeah. Versioning so you can back up or go back in time and then also um, moving stuff from, from computer to computer. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, Git has this feature called branching, where uh, I always thought of it like in Back to the Future 2, like when you know Biff gets the time machine and goes back to 1955 and gives himself the uh, gray sports almanac, and I have come on, at least one of you must have thought the same thing, right? With Git branching, well, anyway, that's the way it works. Um, is that it allows you to say, hey, listen, I've got uh, this line of source code, um, and I want to experiment with something, so I can call, it, I can do is create a branch, which allows other people to still, can, you know, still see that uh, original version of the source code. But now I can change, uh, can change it off on my own um, alternate reality, um, and uh, and make my changes. And if I like the changes, I can contribute them back. I can merge uh, that that code in. You're probably not going to be doing too much of that in in this course, but yes, yeah, certainly in the real world. Um, 
being able to uh, manage all of that and work in parallel like that um, is very powerful because it allows people to, um, here again, work off in their own sandbox and work with others in their own sandbox um, to, uh, to, to get things working, to develop things, and then contribute it back to everybody else. So good, yeah, branching and merging. So I want to take a, a little, um, oh, and then, and then GitHub. Uh, are you guys familiar with GitHub also? Yes. Do you use that for your classes or is it mainly like looking at other projects and stuff? Both? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, how, how do you use it uh, for your class projects? No? No, no one's done that? Or a couple people? It depends. Like some, some, in some classes you can work in teams or pairs. Mm. And so it's really handy for that. Yeah, enabling teams. Yeah, and over there? Uh, yeah, we use it for our project in CS300. Oh, cool. Class. Everyone right. Using That's your software engineering course, right? So there's like a group project or whatever. Everybody's using GitHub to collaborate. Nice. Okay. Cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm also a big fan of GitHub. As a matter of fact, all my... Uh, uh, actually, I'll just go over here. Um, I put all my stuff on, uh, on, on GitHub. I've got a number of repositories. Um, some of which are private. Uh, but, yeah, like Portland State Java is where... Um, all of the uh, all of the source code for the for the courses. So like the archetype that you use, if you want to know how all that works, it's all up here on my GitHub. Um, all of the examples. So feel free to um, to clone this repository to um, to fork it to if you uh, want to do that. It's all out here in the open. Um, and so what I'm going to do now um, is I'm going to create a repository, as a public repository in in GitHub. Um, for uh, for this course, so I'm going to say new repository. And I'm going to call it Portland for sorry for this offering of the course, Portland State Java Summer 2017. Uh, so it likes the name of it. Great. So uh, source code uh, that we develop during class, uh, well during the advanced programming with Java course at Portland State University. Uh, Versity in the summer of 2017. Uh, this is public. Um, if you have a uh, an educational, uh, you sign up for a GitHub educational account, you can get like up to five or something private repositories. Um, I ask that until at least the course is over. Um, you know, keep your uh, please use a private pro repository if you're going to use it for the code in this course. Here again, that way you can say, hey, listen, you know, no one can copy off of me uh, if all my stuff is is private. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I love readme's. Uh, I want to get ignore for Java. Um, cause there's not, wait, is there a Maven? Oh, there is. Okay, cool. All agree. Maven projects and licenses. Um, I like Apache license, uh, two O. Okay. And so, uh, I create a new repository here. Cool. And notice, uh, things like, um, it put a description in the in the readme.markdown. Um, and uh, it initialized it with a couple of things. So a git ignore file. Um, well, that's pretty cool. Uh, so git ignore uh, basically says, hey, git, these are these are the kinds of files that uh, I don't want in my uh, repository. Now, why, why, why wouldn't you want certain uh, files in your code repository? Yeah, garbage like swap, swap files. Yeah, you have backups and like that. Yep. Executables, executables right? Well, why, why don't you want an executable in your source code? You can just find it. You can just file it again exactly, right. So, any artifact that is built, right? So, any like, you know, anything that's compiled, like a class file or a shared object or, um, you know, th those kinds of things, jar files, all that good stuff, um, is. Uh, Huh. Um, uh, is uh, is stuff that you don't want to check in. They're big and is, and it's the kind of thing that uh, you probably don't want to share um, among people. Especially like, like a class file. The sort of the the, the ethic or the um, oh, what's the right word? Words are hard for me tonight. Um, the uh, uh, basically, if it's something that can be built, people should build it. Um, it's source code. It's, it's the source uh, that you want to share. Anyway, source and you know whatever configuration. Um, you need to share. share. So anyway, this is uh, so uh, GitHub is smart enough to know that hey, if you're creating a repository that has Maven stuff, here's a whole bunch of Maven stuff, like your target directory, and I don't even know what the hell all this stuff is. 
um, that you don't want to or you don't want to check in. And so this way, when you uh, ask Maven, hey, what you know, what changes have been made? It won't. In Sorry, when you ask Git what changes have been made, it will include things in your, like in your target directory. Okay, cool. So I've got here um, a uh, a repository, and now um, now the repository the the, the, the Git repository lives here up on GitHub. It's up on you know their site. I want it, but in order for me to um, commit code to push it up here, I need to uh, what's called clone it, or basically make a, a copy of the repository here on my um, uh, on my local machine. So you do that by saying clone or download, and I can copy this to the clipboard. And now over here um, in my Git directory, I want to say Git clone this dude yep and now i've got uh portland summer 2017 uh and now i've got what's in my repository right here's the readme uh, markdown which this is the markdown that was displayed right here um let's see here can i do a git pull does it does it know about the uh Oh, it, it might not, I don't know if it knows about the upstream or not. Um, anyway, we'll check that out. So, great, I have a repository for this uh, for the code that we've written, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the um, that student project that I created into here. And, uh, oh, I was kind of, I probably totally confused IntelliJ. <laughs> Sorry, IntelliJ. Um, and now I've, uh, I, I've got it here. And actually, I will, let's see here. What do I want? I'll show you on the command line first, and then we'll do it in IntelliJ. So if I say git status, this will, uh, uh, this basically says, hey, git, look at the repository that I'm currently in, the directory that I'm currently in, and tell me what's new. Um, well, and sure enough, it says, OK, your student uh, file is new. And so um, I will say, OK, well, I want to uh, add the, everything in the student directory to my repository. And now when I say get status, oh, it's got a bunch of stuff that I don't want, like the .idea directory. So what I'm going to do is uh, add, modify my git ignore to add the .idea directory also. And I'll add right here at the top, uh, .idea slash. Now, unfortunately, I think even if I say status, it'll it's, it'll still show up because I added it. So can I say git? I don't want to say git remove. What do I say? I say git check out show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it reset or check out show? Reset will probably be better. Yeah. Uh, student dot idea. Cool. Okay. Oh, and the IML now. What? Oh, the IML file, same thing. Okay, so now I need to uh, add that again and uh, dot IML. Oops, star dot IML. Star. Uh, it's funny which things I use Emacs for, which things I use VI for. Right? I know. Right. Um, and so now I need to do that uh, git reset students student IML. IML is the IntelliJ module library or whatever the hell it's called. Sorry, what? Oh, thank you. Give it a rest. Who knows what git rest is going to do, right? OK. So unstaged changes after reset. That's cool. Uh, git status. We've got all that stuff. OK, so now I'm going to. Um, do the following. I'm going to say git commit. So right now what I've done is I have. Uh, Git is telling me that here on my uh, local file system, I've made changes that are different from what's in the repository. It said I've modified this file that I already knew about called .gitignore. I edited that, and I've added a whole bunch of new things. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Git, hey, listen, um, commit the changes that I've made to the local repository. So I'm going to say ignore um, IntelliJ files. Um, and I'm going to check in the git ignore. Cool. Um, okay, so what that does is it commits it to my local checkout, that local clone that I made. But now I want to what's called push those changes up to GitHub. So I can do a git push. Oh, good. It knew about everything. That's, that's smart. It didn't used to do that. Okay, and now 
if I uh, if I go back to um, well now if I go uh, here uh, and look at my .ignore file, uh, we'll see that yep the changes that I made locally on my machine are now up there on on GitHub. So here again, the cycle is make your changes, commit your changes, push it up to uh, push it up to GitHub. As you can see, the latest change that I made was ignoring the IntelliJ file. So, right, that's all familiar to you guys. There's no magic there. You know how all that works. Great, good deal. Um, nice. So the next thing I want to show you is how to do this in IntelliJ, because working from the command line is cool and all, and it helps. You know, it's good to understand that. But um, so let's see here. Git. So now I want to open up my IntelliJ project, which is in my port and state summer 2017. I'm just going to say open here. I'm going to open it in a new window. Okay. Okay, a couple of things. Uh, Maven projects need to be imported. Well, I'm going to enable auto import so that everything's synced up. Unregistered VCS root. So VCS is a version control system root detected. I'm going to talk about uh, that, and that's cool. So if I click on that, I can say, oh, look, this thing is under Git, but it's not registered in settings. So this is IntelliJ saying, hey, uh, this is, this is, this is uh, I I IntelliJ's equivalent of Clippy saying, hey, I noticed you might be using GitHub. Do you want to hook up everything up? And the answer is yes. So uh, as you can say, it was called add root. And this basically te tells IntelliJ that, oh, hey, listen, this project is, uh, that this IntelliJ project, my Java project, is then uh, part of a GitHub checkout. And what this does is enables this little version control screen down here, and it says, oh, look, uh, I've noticed you've got these changes. The, the, you've made these local changes to your, uh, to your project. And I said, yes, I have. I have added these files. They are, if they show up in green, they are added. If they show up as blue or something, they're modified. Um, and so now I can do things, uh, well, and now I can tell, uh, in, in so now I can do git things through IntelliJ. So for instance, I'm going to right click here and I'm going to say commit changes. And it gives me this nice dialog box, so much better than the command line, the dash m, and all that stuff. And I'm going to say add um, files uh, for the student application. Whoops. Yeah, the student project. Commit, you can just plain commit them or you can commit and push all in one fell swoop. Um, it does a little analysis. Uh, and it says, oh, there were six errors found. Oh, probably all in the palm. Let's review those real quick. <coughs> what doesn't it like? Oh, well, that's interesting. Can't resolve method get written just standard text. Oh, we'll come back to that. Um, and then it's complaining about some stuff in the palm. Yep, whatever. Um, I can also use this button to uh, commit the changes. Luckily, it remembers the last thing that I, I wrote here, so I don't need to type it in again. I click commit and push. Commit. Yes. And, oh, now it's saying push. Do you want to push up to origin, which is GitHub master? For some reason, it makes the dialog a little too narrow. Over here on the right, it shows uh, what files are being pushed. That's just kind of nice. Here again, easier to use the command line. <laughs> and click push. Uh, oh, when I typed in my password, it failed, but for it still works. I don't quite understand why. Um, and now, if I go back here, uh, my student shows up, and it's got uh, the palm and all of the uh, all of the directories that were created by Maven. Okay, so why is this interesting? Um, so now what I can do is I can go over to the uh, CS department's uh, Linux machines, the ones that work anyway. So we decided Babbage does anyway. Uh, I can I have a Git directory over here, and now I can do my Git clone over here. Is that still on the clipboard? Oh, it is. Sweet. I can clone it over here. Oh, and by the way, well, you, most of you you get most of you have used Git, so hopefully your environment's configured. You got to set up keys and everything like that, and you got to type your passphrase right. Apparently, cool. And now I've got all my stuff over here, and this is very important for you because of the following: I grade your projects on the CS Department's Linux machines. So therefore, you need to make sure that your code works on Linux machines and that you've uh, you know, submitted all of your files and stuff like that. And Git is a really good way to make sure that you've got everything um, synced up between these two machines. So I'll go to my student project and now I'll say maybe verify. And now I'll run, uh, good, uh, and of course it runs much slower on the Linux machines. Um, 
but now it's going off and doing all of the uh, the, the Maven stuff. It's uh, it's got the source code right there from the the Git checkout, and now it's running all the tests and it's building the jar. Or all the unit tests is building the jar, and then it'll run the integration test. Oh, oh, interesting. It does get this problem here. Get text written to standard error. Huh. I wonder what that's all about. I don't want to take the time to. Uh, I really do want to take the time to fix it now. Get text written to standard error. Why doesn't it find that? That's really interesting. So I recently changed that. Something might be messed up there. Is anybody else seeing that? Because it worked fine when I ran it from. Yeah, I haven't seen that. Okay, here again, I'm saying kind of funky in my environment. Oh, I wonder if I did this. Um, uh, projects. Summer 17. Yeah, let's remove all that stuff from the repository and see if that makes a difference. Yep, now it does. Okay, so I had some out-of-date artifacts on mine. Probably had the same problem over here. Oh, no, I don't know why I had the same problem over there. That's weird. Anyway, but anyway, that's how you can use GitHub to um, move your code between your local machine where you're doing development uh, with IntelliJ and everything like that off to the Linux machines where I'm going to run and test your code. Any questions on that? Yeah. So do we have to submit them to Ada? Or do you say make sure they work on it? Um, the submission process is, is different, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, it doesn't leverage GitHub, and maybe I could figure out how to do that, but it doesn't. Uh, but I don't. OK. Let's watch some movies. So let's talk about test-driven development. Um, I'll leave that up. So uh, there is, OK, so um, Bob Martin is a uh, well-known software, software developer who uh, has d uh, thought a lot about and written some very good books about the, the craft of uh, software engineering. He's, uh, he's been around for a long time. He's been involved with some really interesting projects over the years um, and has, has really leveraged all of his observations um, in, into uh, what, what, would he's call, what, what would he calls um, being a clean coder, writing code that is clean. Um, and so he's got this whole definition on what clean code is, um, and he's got a couple books on it. Um, and he also has a, uh, a series of um, tutorial videos where he goes through and explains all of these concepts. So if you're someone that learns well by watching a video, um, I highly recommend that you check these out. Um, they are they aren't free. Um, they're uh, I think for individual purchase there, you know, I don't know, somewhere around $10 per episode. And so then, you know, instead of getting, you know, a sweater from your Aunt Mildred, ask her to buy you one of these for a holiday or whatever. Um, uh, because, I, I, so I learn well from, you know, watching uh, people show me things. Um, and so for me, it's a really effective way. His books are also really good too. He expresses himself well in words. And so uh, I, I recommend that you check it out. One of the things that he talks about in, uh, in clean code is called test-driven development. And as I was saying earlier, test-driven development uh, takes unit testing to sort of the, the, the next level by, by hypothesizing instead of what would happen if instead of writing our code and then writing the test afterward, what if we wrote our code by writing tests? By basically saying, hey, I want my code to do this, so I'm going to write a test that verifies that it does that. And once I've written the test, then I'll write the code to actually do that. Um, and he uh, and he talks about this red green refactor cycle, which basically means uh, write the test and the test will fail because you haven't implemented the code that's testing yet. Implement the code that's testing and then do something called refactoring, which is going through and making your code better. Um, and so uh, I, I'm going to play for you now is uh, a five minute video. This is a clip from one of his clean code videos. Um, where he uh, explains TDD by um, implementing a, a simple, uh, well, a part of a, a simple class that scores a game of bowling, right? So, you know, 10 pin, that whole thing. Um, uh, it's a little cheesy. He can be kind of, you know, 
uh, eccentric at times. He's got this silly hat on, uh, which actually uh, will make sense once you watch the video. Um, but let's take a couple minutes uh, and watch this, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit of test-driven development. Actually, let me let me make sure the the volume's up here. Okay, it'll probably be really loud at first. Sorry, and we'll full screen it. It's time for the red-green refactor cycle, and I am in the red phase. I must write a failing unit test. All right, what test must I write that will force me to write public class game? Well, I'm going to write, um, uh, can create game. Uh, game G equals new game. Oh, heavens. Thank you, IDE. Helpful, IDE. That's enough of that. Heavens to Murgatroyd, that doesn't compile. Well, I must make it compile. So now, I'm going to create the class game. Yes, in the current package, there it is, the class game. And if I go back to my test, oh, look, the test passes. It's time for me to go. To the green phase, I am now green. And in the green phase, it's time for me to refactor. Is there anything I can refactor here? No. Nothing to refactor. Very good. Then I am done with this test. I am passing. Lovely. Back to the red phase. The next test, well, I know I want to write that roll method. All right. Uh, test. Um, can roll. Uh, oh, heavens, I need a game. Uh, game G equals new game. Lovely. Uh, G dot roll. What should I roll? Well, let's roll a zero. Hmm, that doesn't compile. Okay, time for me to focus on making it work. Uh, I'm going to create the method roll. Ha, look at that, roll. And it should take a pins. This is lovely. And I believe that that will pass, because I, I'm not actually testing anything. Oh, time for me to refactor. I've got a passing test. Uh, what's to refactor? Oh, goodness, I've got duplicate code here. Duplicate code. Well, I better take that and refactor that out. I'll create a field named G. I will uh, initialize it in the... Uh, setup method, which of course I don't have, but this will create. I'll keep it private. Lovely. So now I've got a nice setup method. It's going to create the 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 game. It'll put it in the public in the private field G. Uh, can create game is now empty because well it doesn't do anything. And um, I think I can get rid of that line of code in can roll. And all of this should still pass. It does. I think I can get rid of that empty test now. This is common, by the way. You write a test just to delete it later. Lovely. Hmm. Next most interesting test case. Back to red. Well, what can I make fail now? Um, oh, I got to write the score function. Ooh, but I can't call score until I roll a complete game. Okay, so here we get into some of the technicalities of test-driven development. When you must write real code, you write the simplest real code you can. In this case, I'm going to have to roll a complete game. What is the simplest, most degenerate complete game that I can roll? A gutter game. Let's roll the gutter game. Uh, okay, um, um, four, int i equals zero, i less than how many balls in a gutter game? Twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, i plus plus, uh, g dot roll zero, that will roll twenty zeros, that is a gutter game. And now we will assert that the score is zero. Oh heavens, that doesn't compile. I must make it fast. Excellent. I will make this 
compile, it should return an int. I'll have it return a negative one, because I still want to see it fail. It should fail. Yes, and now I will make it pass by returning a zero. This is stupid, but it's also easy. And I have now seen my test both pass and fail. I know my test works. It cost me nothing, but I now know that my test will fail if I don't get a zero. Ah, well, that was nice. What is the next most interesting test case? Or is there any refactoring to do? Mm, no. Next most interesting test case. Okay. Happy coding. <laughs> I have no idea if it was control. Probably not. Um, so, what did you observe in what Uncle Bob did? What are some things that stand out besides the hat? That stand stand out uh, in terms of what he coded and how he approached test driven development. He loves autocomplete. He loves autocomplete. Actually, that's that's a very important observation. He leverages his tools, and this is a thing. Craftsmen and craftswomen, craftspeople know how to use their tools, right? There's there's no you know it's. The Macho VI guys, eh, sorry, you're going to go slower because you're using, you know, because you don't have the tools. So yes, leveraging your tools and doing autocomplete, doing, you know, laying the IDE, do the heavy lifting, even the light stuff, is going to is going to save you. That's a good observation. What else? Yes. Um, he starts with very obvious test cases mm -hmm. and kind of gets more specific. Yes, yeah, starts with obvious test cases, simple test cases, uh, even stupid test cases, and and gets more uh, gets more specific. Why do you think he does that? What would be some sorry? What? It's thorough. Thorough thoroughness. What would the alternative? What would some alternatives be? Write it all and then compile. Write it all and then compile. Right, right. You know, so you start out with the the ultimate uh, complex test case, and then in order to get it to run, you basically have to develop your whole application. Why not do it that way? Um, it defeats the purpose, but certainly isn't in the spirit. Of it, right? I mean, as he pointed out, you want to take baby steps. And actually, if you look at the literature, they say baby steps. Um, so, uh, it, it, so the whole idea is, uh, you know, sort of like how we're taught. And I know uh, how I used to approach problems is like, okay, I'll figure out all of the stuff and keep it in my head, and then I'll start writing. And then I end up with like methods that are like, you know, three pages long and everything like that, and all the complexities there. And I think it works okay, and then I spend a whole bunch of time testing and debugging it. Test-driven development uh, takes a different approach, which says you want to have rapid feedback loops. You want to be validating that your, your code still works um, Every minute, sometimes multiple times a minute. You want to write a little bit of code, test a little bit of code. You want, well, rather, you want to, you know, write a test, implement it, run it, just like he was doing with, with that cycle. Um, and you do this in, in small steps so that you can build up your application over time. And more importantly, you build up a suite of tests. Now, you only saw him develop two, but you know, you know if you got the rest of the video, you'll see that he uh, develops uh, you know, a dozen or so different scenarios, and along the way, he builds up his uh, his, his his class, the the code under test, um, builds it up gradually. But what he what he has along the way is this suite of tests that verify that he hasn't broken anything. Now I don't know about you, but you know when when, when I, uh, I I break things all the time, and like in, inadvertently. Right, and the, the the thing that I always find frustrating is when I realize that I broke that thing a half an hour ago and just found out about it now. Right? Doesn't that suck? Because like your mind is in a different place. If you think about, you know, how at least for me, like as I navigate the application, as I navigate the problem space, thinking about, um, you know, well, what happens if I have this input, or what happens if this thing is in that state. Um, I make changes and I make assumptions, but with uh, but with test driven development, when you have that suite of unit tests, you have the uh, assurance, you have the safety um, that you know that you haven't broken anything. And when you do break something, you find about it within you know thirty seconds, a minute of making the change, as opposed to like an hour later. <coughs> what else stands out to you? 
from that video. Anything? No? Okay. Cool. Um, I'm going to write uh, a couple of tests for this. So let's talk about our student. So we're going to be using uh, this student class uh, for uh, for a while, um, uh, probably you know well into next time too. Oh, I guess I think I closed the uh, the assignment. So I know I sort of skipped through this, but let's go down to the uh, to the interesting part, which is the main method right here. So ultimately, where we're going with the with the student is the following. The uh, what we want to build is a uh, main method that takes the following arguments, and when it's when, when it's sorry when when the main method is run with those arguments, it prints out the following: Dave is a GPA of three point six four, and is taking three classes: algorithms, operating systems, and Java. He says this class is too much work. So you give it these inputs, you expect those outputs. So you could write a test that basically does that: give it those inputs, expects that outputs, and that would be sort of like the big end-to-end -end test, even though I'm sure in your mind you're like, that's easy, right? That's true. This is stupid, but it's simple, right? So let's. Uh, so I'm going to walk through, uh, I'll do a little bit tonight, and then um, we'll finish it off uh, next week, is uh, sort of the test-driven test -driven development approach to uh, implementing, uh, implementing this class. So, so I, I sort of got two components here. I've got the student class, which represents the student itself, and then I've got the main method that deals with all the command line parsing. I'm going to save that until next week. I, I don't care. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write some tests for my student class. Now, I've got the skeleton here that compiles, so it takes the name and the, um, uh, you know, the number of classes as an array list, uh, double as a GPA, gender, etc. Um, but I'm going to do the following. I'm going to write a test, which is um, the following. I'm going to say public void all students say this class is too much work. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call. Uh, I'm going to create a student. I'm going to just call it student equals new student. Oops, student. And the name, uh, who cares? Let's we'll call it a name. It's going to be an empty array list of classes at this point. Uh, GPA of zero, sure, who cares? And then, what is this? This is gender, again, doesn't matter. OK, so I have a student here. And uh, then, OK, I, I want to I, I wanna say, OK, all students say this uh, class is too much work, so I'm going to use assert that. This is a slightly different syntax than Uncle Bob used in his video. His video is kind of old. Uh, the newer uh, clean code videos do use what's called this Hamcrest library. We'll talk more about it next time. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, so we say assert that student dot says uh, equal to oops, equal to this class is to oops is too much work. Actually, did I get the capitalization right? Yes, this class is too much work. Cool. So now I have, uh, okay, I don't have one of those hats, but pretend I do. Um, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to write a test that will fail. And I believe this test will fail. So if I run the test by uh, either clicking here or doing on the Mac, it's Control shift f 10 this will build my project in IntelliJ, run it, and sure enough, it fails. And it fails because uh, this is a stack trace. It's saying what code it was executing. And it said, aha, um, here at uh, line 28 of your student test, it went to call the says method of student, which is uh, implemented on line 34. Click on that, and it says, oh, not implemented yet. Because sure enough, I haven't implemented it yet. OK, now I want to make it green. How do I make it green? Implement it, yeah. And so then uh, I say return this class is too much work. There you go. And so now I can rerun the test from here. And it's green. Yay. Um, so that was the red, the green, and then refactor. Um, is the term refactor familiar to you? Is this something that you've encountered? Yeah, a couple of nods, a couple of not so nodding. OK. So. You know, when you code, it's important to have code that works. 
but it's also important to have code that's easy to understand and easy to modify. And so there is this set of um, coding practices in the right word for it. It's actually tools that you can use to um, make your code cleaner, to e easier to work with. And it's uh, along the lines of things like um, uh, you know maybe choosing better names for your variables and your methods and stuff when um, you deal with object-oriented program. Well, oh, eliminating duplicate code. It was an example that he used, right? He was creating that game object twice in two places. So even though it was like a one-line thing that was duplicated, he's like, no, we should only do this once. And so then instead of creating a new game in every method, he created it in a field of the object. Um, these are the kinds of things that uh, you can do the refactoring, and um, IntelliJ has this whole menu full of various refactors um, that you can use. You know, moving things around, copying, changing method signatures. We'll see more of them as we do more coding together. Um, I'm looking at this code, both the code under test and the test itself. Uh, well, actually, I do see uh, an, uh, an, op uh, an, an opportunity for refactoring. Um, do you guys see it? What? <laughs> ah, yes. Yeah, just like Uncle Bob, I created two students. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to instead of now, Uncle Bob put it in a, a field. I don't really like doing that. I think it'd be better if what I said is, hey, instead of like calling this big long constructor, what I want is I want a method to call that all you do is pass in the name and it'll return me um, one of these students with sort of like default information. So the way I do that is I highlight um, the, the code here that is the new constructor, and I say refactor, and I say extract method, or option command M, and IntelliJ says, sure, I'll create you a new method, uh, and you know, I want to be a private method, the name it suggests get student, I want to call get student named, because it's, uh, it's clear, I pass in the name. I hit OK, so it'll turn. It'll take that code that I highlighted, put it in its own method, and so it creates this new get named method here that takes a string, does all that, and IntelliJ is also smart to say, hey, listen, I noticed that you've got some code down here that looks a lot like that code you just extracted. Do you want to replace this code down here with a call that method also? And I say, well, yes, please, and so I click yes, and so then it replaces it with a call to, to get student. This isn't cheating. This is software development, right? I mean, so you, you know, it, it makes your life easier. This is why you know, and, and this is why people will pay good money for this tool because it finds stuff like this. And now my code's easier to understand. There's less stuff to look at. There, there's um, there are uh, you know, there, there's there's less code there to to understand. Okay. Anything else? Any other opportunities for refactoring? As far as Oh, like where, yeah, in the file? Um, yeah, actually, that's probably a good idea. And so then, uh, and I don't know the menus, I only know the keyboard shortcuts. Um, code, there used to be, there's like move, oh, there you go, move line up. Uh, actually, move statement, I don't know, I want move the whole method. Well, I think, so you can use that thing, it's it's uh, option, option command up. I think we'll move it up all the, no, that was weird. Oh, there you go. It's shift command up. We'll move it up. Yeah. So, I, you know, uh, there have been various debates over the years about like the order of things. For, for Java, um, the Java coding conventions put um, field declarations at the top of the class and then method declarations. And then um, I think pretty much everybody does it that way. And then there are various schools of thought in terms of like, should I have all the private stuff first? Should I have static stuff first? You know, there, I don't think it's so clear and dry. But with a good IDE, it doesn't matter so much because you're navigating around. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is just for like if you for yeah. time being a factor. But in this instance, does the code speak for itself, or does there need to be comments around the file? Ah, yes, good question. Um, so, Dave, you said we should like think in English and write comments first. Um, yes. Uh, however, and and this gets back to the the, the debate about are comments really helpful? Um, I think where I've evolved to is. Uh, 
over the, the, the years, I've uh, thought a lot about how to name my methods and my variables and things like that. And so then, like, yeah, look at the name of this method, right? It's huge. We could have just called it test4. Not very descriptive. So I would argue um, that uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's better to have a method name that is super long and descriptive than it is to have a small method name and then a big, like, three-line comment that explains what it does. Um, so, and this is one of those, do as I say, not as I do, <laughs> sorry guys, um, but uh, so you're not going to see me write that much, that, that many comments, we'll talk about next week, I want you to write comments. So, bad parenting, sorry. Okay, good question then. Okay, anything else? Okay, so, uh, what, what, what do I do? I want to run all my tests now. Yay! All my tests pass. I'm green. I've refactored. Last thing I do, I check in my code, right? Because uh, we have gotten to a stable point. Uh, if I get unstable, I want to come back to a stable point. And so I commit myself off. Uh, yeah, commit myself off to get GitHub. Added a simple test for the says method. And push it up there. Okay. Cool. Um, we'll do a lot more test-driven development uh, next week because there are a couple other things that I want to uh, finish off for tonight. But any questions before we move on? Okay. I next want to talk about uh, your projects. So... Like I said, there's a five-phase project for for the course and uh, this this summer we'll be designing an airline application um, and and so in in, in this project uh, well it, what we're modeling is you've got uh, an airline and it has a bunch of flights that depart from certain airports at certain times and arrive at certain airports at certain times and in this first project what you'll be doing is writing uh, the the very fundamental airline and flight classes and implementing a simple command line program to, uh, to manip manipulate them. And so the, the goal here is that um, there are some classes that I author that I want you to use as part of your application. Um, and then uh, to test your Java programming, um, do some uh, complex uh, command line parsing, or more complex than maybe uh, than was, well, that would have been there with Project Zero. So uh, there, uh, I have a package. Uh, called edu pdx cs 410 j uh, that contains two classes. Do you guys know what a package is? Do you deal with that much when you in your job? So the whole idea is that you've got classes, um, and then those classes live in a namespace called a, a package, and that allows you to have two classes with the same name that uh, you know that are both called student or are well. Actually, in your case, you will all have an airline class. So how do I tell one per, one student's airline class from another? They're in different packages. Okay. Um, and so then there's a package declaration at the beginning of every class. So I wrote some call, code called abstract airline abstract flight that um, describe, well, in the abstract, what an airline and a flight is. What I want you to do is uh, write two subclasses or a subclass of each of those class in your package, one called airline and one called flight. Um, and uh, there are a couple of abstract methods abstract methods. So those are methods that's, whose signatures are specified, but the implementation isn't. Um, uh, and, and so your code, though, it should not be abstract, and so you must implement all those abstract methods. Um, an airline uh, has some properties, like uh, a name, it consists of multiple flights, and a flight departs from some source and leaves um, at a given time, and then arrives at uh, a destination uh, at a given arrival time. Um, for, for this first assignment, everything's going to be a string. We'll learn about using the date class and stuff like that later. Um, if you want to use it, if you're familiar with these things, feel free to use it, but um, uh, it's okay to just model everything with strings right now. Um, and each flight also has an identifying number. Okay, so there are your like domain classes of airline and flight, and there's also a project. There's also a, a, a class called Project One, which contains a main method, which parses a command line and does some stuff with the information on the command line. So uh, there are uh, there are arguments and there are options. Arguments are required 
and they appear in this order. So the first argument, uh, program argument, is the name of the airline and then the, the flight number of the flight that you're entering. Um, and it uh, has a three-letter code of the departure airport, and it departs at a certain time. And the same thing with a three-letter code of the arrival airport, the destination airport, and arrives at a certain time. Um, in addition to having uh, program arguments, there are also program options. There is a dash print option, which will print the description of the new flight by invoking its two-string method. And there's also something called a readme. Um, that we'll go into more detail uh, next time. You can read ahead. Uh, there's a whole uh, PDF about it, um, uh, but let's see what that is. And your dates and times should be formatted like this. So the month, day, the year with slash between them, um, and then in a uh, and, and then a separate command line argument have the hour and the uh, the minute. Do I have an example? No, I don't. I probably should. But anyway. Um, so when working on the command line, uh, the name of the airline is always one command line argument. So if it has multiple, if the airline has uh, uh, consists of uh, multiple words, then you need to put it in double quotes. Um, dates, times, however, take up two uh, command line arguments. And so this is an example of a uh, of a given time. Things like three fifteen two thousand seventeen at ten thirty nine, and also three two two with one digit uh, two thousand seventeen at one o three. So notice that these are um, 24 hour times. Question. Yes? Uh, does that mean you can only take both of them as arguments along the string concatenation? That would be one way to do it, yes. String concatenation. Cool. So, simple command line. Uh, a command line. I don't, I'll let you decide whether or not it's simple. Um, a, uh, a command line uh, interface that works with your airline and flight classes. Now, um, there are some things that are not included in this assignment. Uh, it's kind of dumb. You enter, you uh, run the command line. It creates a flight, adds it to an airline, maybe prints out what the flight was and exits. Nothing is saved from run to run. Don't worry, you'll get to files. That that that's next week, right? Um, you know, baby steps here. Um, there's uh, yeah, so there's no persistence. Um, there's uh, you know, you can't add. You can never add more than one um, uh, flight to an airline. That's okay for project one. Like I said, don't worry, you'll have plenty of time fighting all that stuff in a couple of weeks. Uh, so lots of footnotes that you can read at your leisure. Um, error handling. So uh, first project, you know, the, the, so the goal of this project is really, you know, to get up and running with Java. So, um, you know, stumble through all the things, getting Maven to work and working with IntelliJ or uh, th things like that. Um, uh, and, and then also just like writing some simple Java code, reminding yourself how to do that, or maybe you know um, uh, you know doing some things for the first time, like command line parsing, for instance. So uh, really, uh, the way I'll test your program is sort of sending some bogus stuff to it because there's not a lot of you know, not a lot of happy path functionality to um, to execute. So uh, be sure to handle your errors, and uh, the way I like you to handle them is exiting gracefully. So I don't want to see a stack trace. I don't want to see like some cryptic error message. Make it user friendly, um, and uh, it's you know I give you a couple of examples here, but uh, I think a, a lot of the work of the assignment is to really think about okay what what are the inputs and what kinds of things kind of things could go right, what kinds of things could go wrong. So for instance, if you've got something missing from the command line, or if you have extra command line arguments, that uh, should result in a graceful error. Um, format of day or time is incorrect. Flight number is non numeric, uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and so then, uh, if you uh, so 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 you probably know how to do th you know do a lot of this already. If you don't, uh, review some of the the Java slides for the right um, for the right APIs to call to to validate this kind of data. Um, actually, this line is probably irrelevant now because it's all Maven based. We'll talk more detail details about submitting next time, but please submit all of your code. So the project one .java, the flight .java, and the airline .java. Uh, there's another Maven ar archetype for this, um, and I have that same like put this thing in your settings.xml. Uh, and actually, let me just run through that really quick. Here, I'll just create the airline archetype right here for you. So here I am in my code. I'll run the archetype. Group ID. Oops, CS410J. So my 
Uh, my group ID is going to be Whitlock again. Artifact ID, Airline, I'm pretty sure is what I tell you to call it. Yep, Airline and 10 Snapshot. Uh, and then, yep, please use the group ID for my package. That's what I want. Okay, created it now in the airline. That's cool. Um, I guess now I need to open up a new project in IntelliJ for my airline. New window. Oh yeah, it wants to know about GitHub. Very nice. So now I've got oh, nine unversioned files. Let me add all of this stuff to, uh, I'll add to GitHub. Anyway, but what it creates you is something that looks a lot like uh, what you get for, um, what we got for the, uh, the, pro, uh, the, the for the uh, student. You've got a flight class. You need to write your own airline class, but here's an example of flight. Um, it extends abstract flight, which is my class. Uh, so if we look, we import my abstract flight class right here. Here's the package. Notice it's the Whitlock package. It's what I told the Maven archetype to create. Um, and all sorts of good stuff. I also included some unit tests um, in here. So there's a flight test that, uh, let me hide this right now, uh, has all sorts of good stuff um, as a place for you to start. I highly recommend that you write some uh, unit tests of your own to uh, for both the flight class and then project one and what other uh, other classes that you um, that you, you devise. But here's uh, just a way to get started in uh, in unit tests. So you can run all of them uh, like this and everything should be okay. And it is good. Um, and we'll talk more about the integration text tests next time. So I'm going to uh, quick commit all these up to, um, to my GitHub. Added uh, the skeleton of an airline application for Project One. Yes. Um, for our our Git repos, would you recommend us create a new repo every project? Or you only get five private ones. So um, what I what I recommend, it's like what I did here is I created sort of one for the class, and then I have uh, my projects created underneath that, so you get multiple uh, of the pro Maven projects in that same repo. Yeah. They actually remove the restriction of five. So oh really? Unlimited as oh nice. Okay, cool. So so maybe you don't. Um, up to you. I I. I uh, Yeah, I, I don't know which is which is better. Um, so what? You could also do a local repo too, you could like a local Git repository, and not have it up on GitHub. Yeah, yeah you can totally do that too. Um, and of course, you know that way, like if you know your laptop gets busted, you're out. So you know the nice thing about GitHub is that it's uh, it's it's up there, um, you know, it's in the cloud, and then also you can transfer it to another machine, which you probably couldn't do as easily. With a uh, local repo, but that's definitely an option too. Yeah, yeah. GitLab lets you have another migration. Oh, okay. GitLab two is another option. Also, Bitbucket. Uh, yeah, Bitbucket. Okay. Nice. Okay. So you guys know more than I do about these things. Because anyway, cool, awesome. So okay, that's your project. Um, let's see here. Oh, uh, there's a couple of other things. It's due July 12th. So in a couple of weeks, you get two weeks to do the first. Uh, project, but there will be another project signed next week. I highly recommend that you get started on it very soon. Um, not because I think it's going to take you two weeks to do it, but uh, experience has shown that, uh, and actually you saw it here tonight, that sometimes your environment takes a little bit while a little bit to set up, and um, there you know might be some things that don't work off the bat. So yeah, please do that. And yep. You said that projects are due before class on the day they're due. Yes, so they're due at at six p.m., which is. Oh yeah, one more thing. Um, does anybody object to starting at 6 p.m. instead of 5.30? I know, like, for anybody coming in from, like, the west side of where we're fighting traffic, it's going to be a little more time. I want you guys to have dinner beforehand. I smell french fries. Does anybody else smell french fries? Yes. Yeah. Damn. Um, uh, anyway, okay, so 6 p.m.? Is that, is that cool, everybody? Okay, I'm seeing lots of nods out there. And then, we're not going to go until 10 o'clock at night. Seriously, yeah. 
Um, uh, I'm glad they got this chair. I'm an old man now. I used to be able to like stand for four hours, but I can't. Um, yeah. So so anyway, it's it's due uh, before then. Somebody else have another question? No. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah. That's good. So does that mean office hours at, at Hot Lips are from five to six? Five to six at Hot Lips, yeah. Um, I usually I try to get there right at five, but if I'm like if I've got something at work, I'll let you know if I'll be late late, but um, I try to be there at five. That's cool. Uh, oh, and it's worth seven points, and we'll talk about that what that footnote means next time. Okay, so that's this project. Okay, uh, but wait, there's more. Okay. There's also something called the, the, the Java cones. So, um, you can read a book about the Java language, you can do Java tutorials, um, but there's nothing that beats experiencing writing Java code. It's, it's the best way to learn the language. Um, a, a, a cone uh, is, uh, is something that comes from Buddhist discourse, which is all about a teaching question. Uh, you know, sound of one hand clapping, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and, and often the, uh, the, the answer to a, a cone is, is subtle. Um, it, not so much like tricky, but more like a puzzle that you need to put together. And the, the learning comes not from the answer, but from uh, arriving to the answer. Um, and so uh, a, a tool that I've used that, that I've actually gotten pretty good feedback from the students on over the years um, is, is called, uh, well, the, the, the Java cones. So uh, this is not something that I wrote. There's actually uh, this dude called Matt who um, has this thing up on, on GitHub. And I've forked it, and I've like mavenized it so that it's, it's compatible with the course. Um, but what it is is it's a little program that uh, has a, a bunch of Java source code that um, basically are, are, are little like four-line code snippets that are meant to teach you something about the language. Um, it, it's a lot like test-driven development, like if all the tests were already written for you and what you need to do is figure out how to make the test pass. Um, and uh, so uh, what, uh, what, what I have is I have, oh, this is, needs to be updated. That's well. We'll see if that works. Um, uh, we uh, what what what, uh, what I've done is I've created uh, uh, a an archetype that will let you get started with uh, with these cones. And so let me start that now. Um, right here. Oh, it doesn't like it because my login ID is this. Ah, okay, yeah. The new version of the plugin doesn't like this archetype catalog thing. Fine. So I, I, I need to fix that in the assignment. Cool, it's generating it. Uh, it found it. Okay, now I've got this file called cones. Let me close this project in IntelliJ and then open up the cones in IntelliJ. New window. Uh, no, don't import the Gradle project. Do add it to GitHub. Okay, so I've created the archetype. I've got the cones. Let's talk about what you do. Okay, so uh, the, the cones is a, is a what, what you do is you've got a bunch of uh, source files that you edit in IntelliJ, but then there's this little program that runs that evaluates the cones. So it's not like a JUnit test. Instead, there's a little program that sits there and looks for changes to the files that you edit, and then it'll evaluate the change that you just made and give you some feedback and stuff. So um, what you do is uh, sorry, go to the cones directory here on the command line. And you say Maven exec java cool so it runs the it runs the uh, program and it's saying okay great the place that you start is with uh, the <coughs> excuse me the, the the cone in this file about uh, cones.java and then it gives you this little like helping message it says hey there should be a method starting with at cone called find about cones file look within it for your first lesson once you have solved that, save the file and check back for your next lesson. Okay, ponder what's going wrong in the about cones class's find about cones file method. So now I go back to IntelliJ, 
And uh, I can say navigate to file and then about cones.java. That's sweet. OK. And it's saying, uh, and what the cones told me was look for the find about cones file method. Here it is. It's saying, OK, great, this is a cone. It's called Cohen. Uh, it says about cones file. It's saying, fail. Delete this line to advance. What should I do? Delete this line to advance. OK. We're getting started, kids. Don't worry. It'll get uh, it's way more complex for the end. Now when I go back to my command line, it, uh, okay, it spits out some more stuff uh, because I just made that Cohen pass. And it says, great, now I have one out of 269 of these things. Uh, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, you have to go. Okay, great. A Cohen is considered complete when it no longer throws an exception. Often there is more than one way to solve a Cohen, but only one correct way. This is often hinted at within the Cohen itself or the comments appearing here. Ponder what's going on uh, with definition of Cohen completion method. Okay, ooh, line 18 may offer a clue. Now make haste. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's see. What do I got here? Definition of cone complete. Okay, I've got a boolean called cone is complete equals false, and then if cone is not complete, fail. Oh, well, if this cone complete variable is true. What should I do? Let us ponder. Change it to true. Change it to true. Okay. Ooh, you can delete the line. Okay, where, where, where do you want to go, grasshopper? Try to lean the line first. Okay. Okay, that made a pass. I don't know. Uh, was that the right thing to do? Maybe it was. Do you feel that you've been educated? I like change it to true. Right. Yeah. We're, yeah. It's like oh, doctor, it hurts when I do this. I'm doing that. Okay. Great. Groucho marks everybody. Have a great night. Okay, um, okay, that one's still passed. Okay, great. Now, uh, the dash dash are attempt to communicate the need to fill an answer. Judging by context, what should dash dash be replaced with? So, part of what's going around with about assertions class assert boolean true method. About assertion. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, navigate. So you can either navigate to a class or a file. I'm going to navigate to a class. So, uh, so command n uh, about about assertions, I'm glad I remembered it. Okay, so here we go. Assert boolean true. Okay, there are two possibilities: true or false. What would it be here? So assert true. What should I put here? You guys, we got it. This is why it's advanced programming with Java. Let me tell you. <laughs> Don't worry. Wait until you get the ones with like lambdas and crap like that. Okay. So yes, it passed. Okay. Uh, yeah. Assert boolean false. Okay. True. Actually, no. Let's see what happens when you do true. Nope, you don't move on. So that's the thing. When you don't have it right, you don't advance. So then, yes, obviously, this is false. Et cetera, et cetera. Now, as you've noticed, it starts out easy, right? The next one is assert null. OK, yeah. OK. But it gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, so let's see here. Some object. Give me an object. Object? New object. Object. New object. Yeah, but now it passes. Oh, wait. OK, so about assertion classes, assert null object reference. So moving on. OK, assert not null. Give me a not null object. New object again. OK, yep. that's cool. Anyway, uh, let's let's go on to something a little bit more interesting. Uh, hello world dot equals hello world. Oops. Um, but this like you know shows that hey in Java the way you compare two objects is like this. Uh, yep. Let's find out. Can you put the same method hello world with the So so what would you recommend that we put here? Or what do you, what, what are you experimenting with? What do you four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Great. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, sure. Uh, zero, one, zero, five, seven, nine. So that's ten, eleven. 
11 characters there. And does that equal? So this is called assert equals using expression. And it compiles it and says, oh wait, assert null object reference. Uh, line 31 is messed up. So where's line 31? Oh, no. Yeah, okay. So yeah, make that null. Okay, assert equals using expression on line 42. So here's line 42, and that failed. <laughs> right. And so, okay, so this is meant to teach you what the equals method is. And so then, you know, what, 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 what this is meant to do. So it's not just about getting it passing, right? You can do that. And, yep, you'll get 100% on, uh, on the project. Um, but this is really meant to be a, a teaching method for you to ask questions like, well, what happens if I try this? Or, okay, what exactly does that equals method mean? And then you can go off and search and learn more about, about equals. Um, and, and, so, and, and so then, anyway, uh, this goes through all, there are, as you can see, a whole bunch of uh, different things that, learn, that you can learn about, about, uh, you know, there's a whole Cohen, uh, a whole set of uh, Cohen's dedicated to all the different kinds of equals that you can have, and uh, the different kinds of loops to, to see how everything goes. Um, what my, my students have told me over the years is that yeah, this is you know there there are a lot of these things, but it helps them understand the the, the building blocks of the language. So most of the stuff might be very familiar to you, great, but I guarantee you you're going to find some things that make you scratch your head and say, oh, I didn't know that about Java. And it's the kind of things that can come back and to bite you when you you know, are actually doing your projects. You realize like, oh, okay, this is how your file works, or here's how, um, you know, here's some interesting things about strings. Uh, so anyway, so these are the cones. Let me uh, check them into GitHub real quick. Um, 61 files. Yeah. Ah, wait a second. Uh, oh, and so you can hit Q to exit this, and it'll save your progress. Well, it doesn't save your progress as much as it does. It just you know reevaluates all this stuff. Um, let's see here. So git add cones. Uh, actually, you know what? Before I do that, I'm going to do a Maven clean. So Maven clean will go and delete everything in your target directory. Um, and say git add cones. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Bat file, who cares? Uh, refresh that, and then cool, we got 61 files, all sorts of good stuff. Nothing too weird. Oh, we got some jar files and stuff? Eh, forget that. Let's see here. Oh, interesting. Meh. Gradle wrapper. Oh, do I want to delete those? Well, I'll just remove them from. Can I remove them from git git revert? No. Eh. You know what? It's late in the evening. Let's go nuts. Let's check in some jar files. Woo! -hoo. Yeah. Uh, okay. Added uh, the Cohen's project. Get arm actually removes the file though, doesn't it? Okay. Hmm. Didn't really need to perform code analysis, I guess. Okay. Commit. Commit. Push. Awesome. It's all up there. So. Um, this is uh, an assignment that I think basically was that the next four weeks to work on. Um, like I said, there are 200 some odd Cohen's. Uh, please start now. Um, so I, you know, I recommend that uh, you know you just do a little bit every every week, make some more progress. Um, experience shows that the students wait until the end uh, can struggle with it because by the time you know we're at July 26, you're on to more interesting well, and challenging projects. For, for, for the rest. And so really, you know, this, uh, I recommend that you front load the work here, uh, first of all, just to get it done, but then also more importantly, this will teach you about the language. Um, the more, you know, I recommend that you invest uh, in, in, in the Cohen's because it'll help you um, uh, do your projects easier. It'll help you go faster on your projects. Um, any questions on this? Other than the submission, and we'll talk about that next week. You want us to complete all the work? Sorry, what? Oh, yes. Okay. So, so the whole, yeah, the whole idea is that um, uh, you, uh, yes, please do all of the cones, um, and uh, that's how you get full credit for the project. Yep. All of them passing. Okay.
I'm done. Are you done? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was a very long night. Uh, and then, so that was what? Uh, uh, sorry. Let's, uh, let me say my final words, then you can leave. Trust me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for, first of all, you know, expressing all the interest in the course. I, I apologize again for the, uh, the confusion, the frustration of the last few days around registration. Um, like I said in my email this morning, I was confused and frustrated too. Um, so, uh, I've got, uh, you know, please make sure, I've got the cards from everybody. I know who is here. Um, I'll, uh, I'll go home, I'll reconcile who was here, who was not here, um, and figure out who uh, you know, ultimately uh, will be enrolled in the course. And actually, if there's anybody that after the first night has decided, you know what, this isn't for me, I want to drop, please let me know now, and, uh, and I'll drop you, and it'll be totally okay with me, because, you know, after experience for a night, I realize it's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, so, uh, please uh, start in on the assignments. Uh, please join the Google community. Uh, if you have questions, especially things about like getting started with Maven or something your environment isn't working, reach out now um, so that we can remove all the impediments to you being successful. And I look forward to seeing uh, those of you who are enrolled next week. Bye now. Oh, thank you. Wasn't that good.